record on this computer. All right. So you guys can join. And we will start with some small questions about collections. So today lecture is about collections and Rust. Um, I have prepared a lecture on uh, State and Haskell. And I it, um, it turned out to be quite a longish rant. Uh, so I, I had to cut it. And also, I can't really try. Um, uh, encode it properly. So I'm going to put the first hour online after the lecture, and then I will put the final part um, afterwards. The code is already in, in the repository. So if you go, um, yeah, so a, a kind of a, a short digression. Uh, if you go, uh, let me see. Git. I still don't see. Okay. Course. So. So if you go to the repo and you go to the. Um, oh yeah, I didn't push it yet. All right. So I I will talk about it uh, in the uh, in the next uh, lecture. So there, there is a code called um, RP, RPN calc, and it's a reverse Polish notation calculator done with the state. And the lecture that I'm gonna put up is um, explaining how you can do it uh, using the state monad. And then I will uh, discuss a little bit the state T and also the, and the uh, reader and writer monads. So, but yeah, so let's focus here on, on Rust. So let's see, I have to do this. Yeah, so any questions you have, you can post uh, through the, the, uh, the lecture. And then a uh, question to you, what is a collection? So, what do you think collection is? You should know collections from um, C++ and from Go. So you should know, um, you have kind of an intuition what it is, but how would you define it? So no questions so far. Yeah, you can have a collection of packages. That's uh, one interpretation of it. What else can you say? So a collection of packages, we, we can say that, but we usually don't use the, the term in this way. Yeah, that's right. So it's a, a way of storing things as storing some data structures or types. Yeah, that's right. So it's a data structure containing various, va various values. Um, and it's some sort of storage, right? So you, you use the term store and here it's a uh, containing, right? So you have some sort of a store where you keep stuff in, right? So that's, those are good answers. Um, so give me some examples from uh, programming languages that you know of what type of collections you that those languages have and what have you used before. Perfect. So we have vector, which is the, the prominent here. Um, so most, most programming languages have something like a vector or a list. I'm always confusing those two. Uh, but you know, in Haskell, we have lists, but they sort of behave in a very similar way to, let's say, Rust vector or C++ vector. You can add uh, the, the difference with list is that when you're appending from the front, 
it's much more efficient than appending from the back. Whereas uh, with vector, well, not necessarily. And, um, you know, it, it kind of depends how you're implementing, uh, under, how the underlying implementation is. Uh, map, sometimes it's called a dictionary, sometimes it's called a hash map. Um, it's a kind of a mapping between, you know, two values. Um, class is similar. So in JavaScript, we have an object, which is effectively a dictionary or a map. Um, we have queues, we have stack, we have array. Uh, array is typically a fixed size um, vector, you could say. Um, so the, the, there are like conceptually, when you think about this, there are some typical uh, data structures that we use and they have slightly different names in different programming languages and they might have slightly different implementation. Uh, so for example, you may have a list which is backed up by a vector, in which case um, um, adding elements is kind of costly because you have to have a pre-allocated uh, space for like where the elements will fit. If you have a list backed up by a linked list, uh, then adding elements is uh, you know super fast because you don't need to pre-allocate the uh, memory for the list. You can kind of append uh, by manipulating the pointers or how uh, things uh, are linked. So it, it kind of depends. The same with maps. So typically we implement maps by a hashing function uh, such that we can organize the keys um, into internally in um, more uh, efficient representation. And that's why in most languages, the, the maps or dictionaries are called hash maps. Great, so that's a kind of a good, um, good starting point. So what are collections use, useful for? So why do we use them? So let's say, you know, you have, um, yeah, so grouping data, storing data, that, 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 this is great. Uh, but imagine that you have a language like C and in C you have an array and you can do everything like this using an array. So why would you need a vector or a list or a stack or a hash map? Uh, you can kind of uh, implement everything using, um, you know, a, a single data structure, which is effectively just an array in memory. Uh, in C and in C, you kind of do that, like you implement everything using, you know, arrays. Um, so one suggestion is giving data useful names. Yeah, but it, it goes a little bit deeper than that, right? So exactly. So the keyword here is an abstraction. So given those additional data structures, those additional concepts, we can kind of abstract away what is the underlying implementation, right? So when I'm talking about the list in Haskell, I don't care how it is implemented. Whereas if I were talking about the list in C, I kind of need to implement it because there is no thing like a list, right? So I have to think, okay, what I'm gonna do? Like I'm gonna back it up with an array and how it will work or should I back it up with a linked list? So at some point, those, those discussions, those distinctions become irrelevant because your implementation kind of sits on top of a list. And then the underlying list, let's say, doesn't matter anymore for the stuff on top of it, right? So collections are very useful abstractions about, about above a certain implementation details that we sort of stop thinking about. So if you're doing some system level programming or you know, if you're doing implementation in C, of course, someone will need to deal with it, like probably you, right? So at some point you will need to implement your um, vocabulary and your kind of terms such that you can use them on this higher abstraction level. But in some languages that's kind of given to you. Uh, and then you basically use it. So when you were programming in Haskell using a list, you didn't know how it is in implemented and how Haskell tries to make the, uh, the immutability of list kind of efficient such that, you know, when you add something to the top of the list, you don't need to reallocate the entire list and, and do kind of, a, you know, all these operations, which you would th need to think if you were kind of doing it yourself in, in C, let's say. Um, so the keyword here is an abstraction. Exactly. Very good. Very good point. 
All right, so now uh, give me some um, useful functions that you used in connection with collections. So, you, you know, we went through some uh, typical collections like vectors, lists, uh, maps, and so on. And then what sort of functions you could do on them? What do you remember from the programming languages that you know so, so far? So some yeah, useful or less useful functions that, you, that you've used. All right, so pop and push, great for stack. Insert for vector or um, map as well. Append for list, find, sounds good. What else? Give me more abstract functions. So those are all good, good examples. Those are quite, um, those are quite primitive functions, right? They don't have a lot of abstraction in them. Like, you know, uh, push or push back. Yeah, just adds an element, right? Um, in it and last, those are good, yeah? So those are more abstract, right? It's the last element of the list and, or, uh, you know, um, the tail or head as well. Yeah, there is a head. Yeah, what else? Tail, head. What else can you do with, with collections? Find, yes, that's, uh, and filter. Those are kind of a very, um, yeah, they are more uh, rich in, in uh, semantics, especially filter, right? Uh, find also, um, so they, they need to, do something with the list and get something out of it, right? So you, you usually need to use some high level functions to deal with filter or with, um, um, what was the other one with find? Yeah, reduce, uh, this is, uh, what, what's the other term that we've used for the reduce function? What, what else kind of uh, relates to reduce? from uh, Haskell, for example. Fold, yeah, perfect. So fold is another um, kind of function that we can do on, on collections. Um, and we, in Haskell, we had fold left and fold right. So we could kind of fold or reduce the collection either from left-hand side or from right-hand side, right? Um, so those are um, kind of, um, useful functions, what else? For example, and uh, yeah, let me see if I have the, where are my terminals? Oh, come on. Um, yeah, I will not, I will not type. Um, I can type in the in the ID. So um, so for example, we had um, so imagine that I'm in the that this is Haskell. Um, so if I have a list, um, I have a list of numbers. So I have um, you know a list of numbers. Uh, what else could go in front? um that we've used so for example function like sum can i use sum with a collection yep uh or product or min uh no, no min was for uh yeah i don't remember if min was for the collection or minimum was for a collection one is for Two numbers and one is for the collection. Um, same with maximum, right? So those are kind of a, a, a other functions uh, that we can do. Uh, we have the folds, fold left and fold right. Um, we had um, in JavaScript, for example, I can do something like for each, right? So this is another function. Some, someone mentioned the lambda. So that's, um, yeah, I can kind of uh, have some sort of lamb lambda here. Um, lambda that is kind of executed on, on each of the elements. So we have kind of a, a rich number of different, um, 
um, different functions that we can we can use in the context of, of a collection, right? And then again, the keyword here is abstraction. So with languages that we don't have folds or for each or you know things like this. We usually need to do it by hand. So for example, if I don't have for each, I have to do a for loop, which iterates over an index and then extracts some items and so on, right? We, we used to do that in C and in some old C++. And then we had kind of a more kind of a user-friendly uh, ways of iterating over a collection with this for each kind of function, which was doing the, the, the bounce checks for us and it was giving us all the elements such that we don't need to care about the index and things like this. The, all those boilerplate uh, instructions are sort of abstracted away. And we just say, yeah, do this for each of the elements of the collection, right? Um, so the keyword here is, a, again, a abstraction. So uh, if you take those functions that we just discussed and you rank those languages, in order of how many functions of, of this abstraction layer they have, how would you rank those languages? So which one would have the largest number of functions which you could use on top of collections and which one would have the least number of those, of those functions? So try to rank the languages. I, I didn't put Rust here because we are gonna discuss Rust today, but uh, how would you rank the uh, the abstractions. That's that sounds um, pretty much how I would rank it, right? So I I would say um, JavaScript and Haskell are quite rich uh, by default. They have quite a lot of um, um, those mechanisms and those abstractions built in, uh, such that you can you can use them. C would be at the bottom. And then uh, Go and C++, well, they are sort of similar. Uh, C++ is evolving. So depending which version of C++ you take into account, they, they have uh, more and more um, facilities to abstract some of the implementation detail away from you. Uh, but they are definitely not in the same category as the first two, right? So JavaScript and Haskell are by by far much more abstract compared to those, uh, those uh, um, say, system programming languages. Uh, the interesting thing is now that Rust sort of has the benefits. It, Rust is in this category in terms of usage, right? So Rust is uh, sort of a replacement for system level programming language like C++ or C, and it can fit into some of the application like in embedded systems and, and so on. So it, it kind of belongs to this type, to this category of languages, but it is distinctly more powerful and has more uh, richer um, vocabulary in terms of abstractions. So it, it kind of sits above Go and C++, right? So it is not as powerful as abstract as Haskell and JavaScript, but it is much more expressive than uh, Go and C++, for example. So we do have uh, uh, functions such as zip or fold or map or sum in Rust. Uh, which operate on collections and they are kind of built in. Uh, they are, you know, in a standard library, and that makes the Rust a little bit more expressive and more powerful than uh, than the number three and number four here on the list. Um, all right, so let's see what's next. Yeah, so the next thing is we just go and talk about the collections in um, in Rust, and I have a couple of examples. Um, so we will start with strings, and then we will move on to vectors, hash maps, and we talk a little bit about generics. So I, I didn't prepare any um, questions about um, generics, but again, with languages that do offer a ability to uh, program in kind of a more abstract way, uh, you have nicer facilities in terms of collections as well. Uh, because you can express certain algorithms in a, in a generic way, uh, which applies to different concrete types. Uh, whereas, for example, in Go, uh, at least the, the current Go, which doesn't have generics, 
you have to implement your behavior or you have to implement your sort of abstract algorithms for each specific type separately. And that's kind of uh, painful to, to some extent. You can do some uh, shortcuts, like for example, with the interface uh, curly braces or like in, um, yeah, but that that doesn't work all the time. So uh, generic is uh, generics is kind of a, a yeah, powerful concept, but we probably not gonna uh, manage to to go there. All right, let me see if I have. Um, I need to see chat. No, no one said anything. Okay, if you have questions, then um, yeah, put it in the chat. Hopefully I will see it. I have to work with a single screen today, so I'm a little bit um, not as efficient. Okay, anyway, so we talk about strings first. So in, um, in Rust, as you remember, we have two concepts of, of string. We have um, something which is a string literal. So if I say, um, you know, if I say let s equal uh, literal, then it becomes uh, a string, immutable string literal. Uh, and um, I cannot really append anything to it and I can modify it. Uh, so if you want to have a string as a, as a collection, as a something that you can manipulate as a sort of a data structure which holds characters, then you have to turn it into a string. And then you can turn it into a string via to string uh, method. Uh, and then it becomes you know, a string object, or you can turn it via to owned. Um, I'm not so deep into the um, uh, Rust uh, idiomatic way of doing things, but from what I gathered, uh, the to string is a more generic um, function, which works for various types, which turn a particular type into string. And then for string literals, the convention is to use to own because it could be implemented in a more efficient way. Uh, there seem to be no difference in terms of the actual implementation and both sort of behave the same. Uh, but yeah, I, I presume that to own is a more idiomatic way of turning a string literal to a string. All right, so then if we have a string, we can um, do some, some things with it. So for example, we can um, iterate over the, the characters or we can check the length of the, of the collection, right? So in our case, it's sort of like a list of characters and or bytes. And then um, we, uh, we can kind of iterate over. Yeah, I was transcoding the, the video lecture. So let me just quick quit the Premiere Pro such that it doesn't occupy safe yes excellent so um with strings uh you you probably notice that in go as well um we have to deal with the um with strings that occupy um yeah so so let's say i have a string and it says hello so how long it, it's gonna be if i if i ask for the length so let's print, uh, let's print the length of the string. How long, how long do you think it will be? So S len. So if I run it, yeah, let me see if I can move this. Uh, where can I move it? It's Yeah. yeah, it's not that convenient. Yeah, anyway, we should be okay. So, so it says the length of this particular string is five. And if we check, it kind of appears to have one, two, three, four, five characters, and that looks uh, perfectly reasonable, right? But what if I put some um, 
some Unicode. So for example, I say hi in Polish. Uh, so which is um, Cześć, right? So uh, we have now uh, again one, two, three, four, five characters and um, they are using Unicode characters because we have those accents in Polish. Uh, and now it says it's seven, right? So it kind of looks, the, the string, oh, come on. The string looks um, as if it has five characters, but the length function returns seven. Uh, that kind of highlights the complications that we have with UTF. So in UTF, the normal ASCII characters, they occupy one byte and that will be reported as a single, you know, a single character, single byte. But in UTF-8, some of the uh, characters with accents and from other languages may occupy up to three uh, bytes. And that's why the, those two final letters, they actually are represented internally as uh, two uh, byte sequences. So a single character is actually two bytes, not a single byte. And that creates kind of a complication of how we treat the um, how we treat the characters. So in in um, different languages, you you kind of deal with it differently. But in in general, there is a concept of a character, and the character is of a variable length. It can be a single byte, or it can be a you know two or three bytes. Uh, the byte is always a byte. So if I ask, okay, how long is my uh, my string? It will tell me in bytes how long it is. But if I actually want to check how many characters do I have, uh, then you have uh, a function called uh, cars. And that returns you um, a collection of characters that that underlying string has. And then you can treat, uh, you know, you can iterate over characters instead of over bytes. If you want to iterate, iterate over bytes, you have, you know, a bytes function. So that returns you, an, again, kind of like a, an, um, an iterator over the bytes of the underlying collection. What is an iterator? An iterator is, um, it's actually quite a cool concept in Rust. Uh, it's a very simple mechanism, which converts anything that you have into something that has a sequence of items. So if you look, um, if we go to the uh, collection, where do I, yeah, I have iterator here. So an iterator is um, effectively a trait uh, which has um, a method next. And the method next basically returns either nothing or like none in, in Rust or um, uh, a robbed option of an item that is the next item of that, of that kind of collection or, you know. So the iterator is typically done on top some form of collection, but you can have like a counter and then you don't really have a collection underneath it, but you just have an iterator which can give you the, the next item of this abstractly speaking collection, right? So this trade you can implement yourself on the various data types that you use and you can use it, for example, for Fibonacci numbers or for uh, some other sequences that you deal with. So you don't really need to have like a collection underneath it, but typically, you know, if you think about the iterator, you can kind of think that you do have some form of a collection or a list underneath it, and then you can call next. Uh, so with strings, um, we have this kind of notion of either treating the characters as characters or treating the bytes as bytes, and you have to make this distinction. The, prob the, um, the thing is that if I, um, if, if I access, um, you can access the elements of the um, this particular collection using the, the square square braces, and then you you will get a character which is indexed with this particular index. Um, so if I have, so if I print print line again, um, let's print this um, this character. Right, so that should that should work. So let's run it. Um, yeah, we cannot index it by 
yeah so i can't really index it with the um with the integer value um so what can i do i can get um i can get a number yeah so i uh, let's try that Yeah, so here, uh, again, it kind of warns me that, you know, I should not be doing that with the, um, with the index because it doesn't know if I really want the zeroth character or if I want the zero byte, right? So I have to be quite explicit if I'm kind of getting a byte out of, the, uh, um, out of my underlying string or if I'm getting a character. And that's why uh, we we have the uh, the the bytes and um, cars uh, interpretations, and then you kind of use it um, um, accordingly. So string is um, mutable, so I can have two strings. So for example, I have my chest, which is uh, high in polish, and I can say um, name, and I can say Marius. And I can say again to owned, and then I can print. Um, so I can have uh, greeting, which is um, s plus space plus name. Let's try that. Uh, that kind of doesn't work because I need to say to old here. Uh, let's see. Um, yeah, let's just don't muck around with the string literals. Let's just deal with strings. Okay, so we have a string. We have a greeting, which is a string. Um, and then... All right. So let's see if that will work. Yeah, we didn't print the, the greeting. So let's print the greeting and we say, um, all right, so. That kind of works, but it you know uh, concatenated the uh, the first string with the second um, argument, and I would like to have space in between, and then I could concatenate it with uh, with space. But <clears throat> there is a, a, a nicer function. So there is a function, uh, actually a macro. Um, so let's say uh, I want the greeting to be format. And format works um, same as uh, print, such that you can uh, use the formatting um, formatting elements, such that I can inject the space here, and I can say I have s and name. Such that now I will have. Um, you know the the greeting with the name uh, separated by a space, um, and the macro will kind of do all the underlying necessary things for me, right? So now I have kind of a nicely formatted string. Um, okay, you can also use uh, strings to do some simple parsing. So for example, we have uh, this reverse Polish calculator. So if I say ten uh, to multiply. And I would like to um, to parse it, right? So uh, let's say I want to parse it by uh, tokenizing it into tokens uh, separated by empty space. Then there is a, a function called split white space, which does exactly this, right? So split white white space will convert the uh, the string into the um, iterator over all the all the tokens, like the sort of like a list. Um, 
So I can say, okay, let tokens tokens be this um, this list, and then I can yeah. So let's say I can print this. I can print my tokens, but um, you know the um, the split white space doesn't implement display such that I cannot use the display, but I can use the debug uh, formatting. So if I do this, then it will work, and I can check how it looks like after um, after parsing. And it says, okay, the split white space is has some sort of internal representation. Uh, and yeah, yada yada yada, and it has some sort of way of uh, showing me um, how how it kind of looks like internally, uh, and it yeah, it's a little bit uh, tricky to see. So let's do a simple iteration instead. So let's do um, for token or for t in tokens. Um, let's do some printings. So we have now T, which should be just a string, so it should be printable. And we can, yes, let's format it nicely and let's run it. So now I have uh, in each line, the single token that I got from my uh, from my collection uh, from from my string, and then I can kind of do something with with them. Um, <clears throat> if I try, so you know, I have I have three line two lines of getting the string and getting the token. So as a curiosity, let's try to do that in a single line. I don't need this underlying um, like. You know, I actually need it, but let's try not to need it. So if I say um, split white space here, I don't need this line. And now this becomes my tokens, right? So I can simplify my code by saying, well, I have some string. I, I kind of turn it into like string literal. I don't turn it into a string. And then I, you know, the logic is exactly the same as just before, right? So if I try to run it, um, I will have problems, and the problems are because Rust um, uh, borrow checker is unhappy with the temporary value of the of this string here being kind of um, freed at the end of this um, um, expression uh, or statement, uh, to be precise, such that this. Um, um, iterator over the tokens kind of lost the um, the backing store that was used as the source, right? So basically, you can't do that. So the the way to deal with it, you actually have to do what I've done before: that you have a temporary variable which you sort of don't don't need normally uh, in some other languages. Uh, but to make the borrow checker happy, you have to have this. Um, uh, this S that is not destroyed because S continues to live until you know the the closing um, context. So the lifetime of S is until this bracket, which means the iterator can use the the backing store, the the actual data uh, from the from S until that point. Whereas with the previous operation, uh, we kind of uh, freed S at the end of this expression. Um, the, the, the combined expression, okay? So um, sometimes in Rust, you will encounter those issues and you will usually need to introduce an additional variable or you will need to introduce additional context. Um, and that's just to make the borrow checker happy to kind of explain to the borrow checker uh, what you're really doing such that it can verify and validate that it's correct, right? I mean, the, the previous code, um, Semantically, in other programming languages, is the same as this code. In Rust, it's not because in, in Rust, the uh, this line kind of uh, changes, uh, like um, checks the underlying string lifetime uh, such that it 
can be used while I'm using the, the tokens. Um, with the previous line, that check failed because the underlying S, the underlying string was kind of freed because it was not used afterwards. It didn't exist in the, in the context of my computation, right? So the semantics is slightly different. I mean, the, the syntax, it looks really like um, in C++ or, you know, um, even in, in, in Haskell, if you kind of turn it around, but the, the semantics is, is a little bit different. All right, so that covers, uh, what else do I need to talk about strings? Um, yeah, the temporary variables, the UTF boundary. Yeah, so then you have those um, two operations that you can use and the get is um, almost always the safe way of accessing some items out, out of the underlying collection, uh, such that you get um, none if there is a problem or you get an option with, uh, with some value if everything worked fine. Uh, this one, however, if, if something goes uh, wrong, it will panic and it will crash the program. So um, let's use uh, vectors for the demonstration of that. So the next um, kind of a, a, a collection type that we often use is a vector, uh, which I all, almost always call either vector or list, like depending you know, what comes to my mind, like I'm making this mistake. Um, so if, if we have some, um, some data and here we have either, we can either say uh, we have a new vector um, and then we have to sort of, um, uh, we, we don't have to, but usually um, we could specify in a generic term what this vector holds. Uh, and the vectors like lists in, in Haskell, they can hold this only the values of the same type. So uh, for example, in JavaScript, or I think in Python as well, you can kind of store anything in a, in a list or in a vector, uh, and you can mix types uh, in, in kind of languages like Rust or Haskell or C++, usually you can't, you, you can only store the same type. So what is stored in a vector is this question mark here, that like Russ doesn't know yet. Uh, and then you can push, if I push one, um, and then I can, um, yeah, so I can print, print what I have in my, um, in my collection and I can say data not date. Yeah, so I have, and at the moment I did that, you've noticed that the question mark changed to integer 32, right? So now um, the Rust worked out that what I'm intending to store in my vector is integers i32 and it kind of default to that, right? So now if I want to store like i8, it will complain that the, the data actually stores uh, i32. Um, you also notice that it got uh, highlighted because my data currently is immutable. So to actually push stuff into it, I have to make it mutable. Um, if you only like, let's say I'm only gonna store um, uh, two values, right? So I'm only gonna store one and two. Uh, and then I had to make my uh, data structure mutable to initialize it with those two values. And then there is a macro which kind of does this for you if you want to. And then you don't need to make the, your data structure mutable if you don't want it to be mutable. You just say um, using the, the macro, you initialize your, uh, your vector with those two values. And then um, it will have kind of exactly the same effect uh, by inferring the type it inferred the, that I'm storing uh, integer 32 and it initialized it and it is it became immutable, right? At that point, like I cannot uh, do additional push. So if I try to do push, um, push three, it will kind of complain that, yeah, look, uh, that data is immutable, so you can't, right? So depending on, the, uh, on what you're doing, uh, you may want to use the macro or you may want to use the, you know, um, uh, uh, the new function to initi initiate a new vector for yourself. Uh, again, vectors don't have the display uh, facility. So to, to show a vector, you have to use the debug um, option. 
And then if we print this, we will basically see uh, it kind of formats the um, the the data as if it is a list in Haskell or array. Uh, or, yeah, so it kind of lists you all the elements. Um, and then, yeah, this get and uh, square brackets. So if we if we don't print the whole data, instead, if we uh, try to print the first element of my um, of my collection, and because it's an integer, I don't need a debug. I can use the display. Um, it will work, and it will print me uh, my number one. So it's my first element of my of my collection. If I say print me the second element, it would work also. But if I say print me the third element, um, obviously I'm outside of range now, right? I only have two elements, and I'm asking for the okay. I'm asking for the third element uh, here. So then if I if I try to run it, um, we will have a crash, right? So the program uh, panicked. And it says index out of bounds. The length is two, and the index is two. So I cannot have uh, length two and index two. I can only have uh, index with length minus one, right? So I can only index zero and one. I cannot index two or more. Uh, and then we have a crash. We have a program which basically uh, crashes. Um, so to prevent that, like if you, I mean. Sometimes you are uh, programming in such a way that you don't allow in indexes to be outside of bounds. And then if you want the panic in case something goes wrong, somebody made a mistake, and then you do have index out of bound, and then the program should crash. Um, so in that case, you can sort of leave it. But in some cases where you kind of depend on the user input, or if you're reading some data and then you don't want your program to crash, you want the program to sort of recover, uh, to uh, retry or to do something um, something else, then instead, yeah, let's do print line. Yeah, we already have a print line, so I just print two values. So let's say um, index zero is this, and then index two is this. Right, so I, I'm kind of printing to value, and I have data with zero and data with two, and then it will not work because this this will crash, right? So then instead of using the square brackets, you can say get. Uh, if you say get, uh, you're not gonna get um, the um, yeah. So let me let me show you. So let value equals uh, data get two, right? So we're not getting an integer with get, we're getting an option. Um, and that means, you know, it will not panic. Uh, it will just give me none if I don't have a value with this particular index. Again, um, that complains that you know option doesn't implement display such that I cannot just display it with the display uh, formatting. I have to use the debug formatting, um, and I can sort of show you what this is, uh, and that that would be none, right? So um, I'm already getting it. So let's say it's value, right? So let's see. So we, we see index zero is one uh, and index two is none. And our program works and our program doesn't panic, even though I'm trying to access a value out of, out of range from my underlying um, uh, collection. So that, that is great. Uh, and that allows you to kind of uh, deal with um, uh, out of bounds situations if you want to to deal with them yourself. So then uh, what we can do is also um, so you, you've noticed that um, data get returns me an option. Um, I have some facilities here to actually get the underlying um, integer, right? So if I use unwrap, um, like you know from Haskell, you know this sort of uh, it's kind of like a maybe type. 
So you have this, uh, it, it, it creates you sort of like a monadic, monadic um, context in which your integer value is kind of uh, inside. And then if, I, if you want to get there, you can say unwrap. But you know, in case when unwrap is called on none, this will panic, right? So again, if I do this and I want to print the number and, I'm don't, and I don't use the, uh, the uh, debugging display, I'm using the proper display because this is a reference to a i32 value. Then if I try to run it, what's going to happen is I, again I'm, I'm going to have a panic in my code because unwrap now um, so you see um, the thread main panicked because you called unwrap on none on none value right so um, to get to this integer and you you need to call unwrap but to get to this integer on none will kind of panic so let's say um, um, yeah, I, what I want is, um, let's say I want to get this uh, second value um, out of the, my underlying collection, and I want to multiply it by 10. Um, and then to multiply it by 10, I have to unwrap it. But because I can get none, it means I, I can't unwrap it, right? So same as with, um, same as with Haskell, here you have this kind of a nice feature that you can do operations on inside of the type in such a way that it will work if there is a value and then it will give you none if there is none value. So I don't need to unwrap it to multiply it by 10. Um, so, so let's say, um, uh, so the, yeah, it's a, you, you know, co contrived example, but uh, get three numbers from the user and print, print first and third multiplied by 10, okay? And I kind of got only two numbers from the user. So it just happened that instead of getting three numbers, I got two, and then I have to somehow deal with it, right? But my logic is, okay, my third number should be multiplied by, uh, by um, so third. So this is my third value. Uh, I'm getting it from my underlying collection and now I want to multiply it by 10, right? So I have the result and the result is um, value third. And now I need to multiply it. So to, to do that, there is a, a map on, uh, on options and it takes a, a closure. Uh, yeah, it takes an inner function, doesn't need to be a closure. Uh, which kind of uh, computes the, uh, the value that you want. And in my case, um, so I will have, uh, let's say X, and I want to say X times 10, right? So now I have the result, which is my third value multiplied by 10, and I never unwrap it, right? So now if I say result, and again, to, to print the result, I have to use the debugging feature because I don't have, I'm, I'm printing an option here. I'm not printing the number. Um, and then I can run it. Uh, let's run it, but let's add the, such that we know what is, yeah, what is what. So run. So now I got the, the first value is one uh, because you know it's one. And then the, the third value is none because I don't have the third value, uh, but I still multiply it by 10, right? I didn't because there is no value, but if I got, uh, if I cor correctly got the third value from the user and I kind of rerun it, it will still, still work. And my code is kind of independent of a user error, right? So again, uh, it kind of works and I get some 30 uh, because the user gave me the third value and I, I kind of did the operation that I needed to do. Um, so that kind of demonstrates that um, you do have some kind of very nice facilities in, in uh, Rust, which allow you to deal with kind of uh, errors and unknown values uh, the same way that you have in Haskell. Uh, and you don't need to unwrap everything. It is a little bit idiomatic in, 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 in Rust that a lot of people kind of do unwrapping everywhere, uh, but you don't need to. Uh, you can kind of deal with uh, error situations the same way as you dealt with them in Haskell. 
and that's that's kind of very nice so that's also um additional um element here is that if you want to store in your vector um two different types so for example we are getting from a user you know numbers but we also getting some operations like uh, for example we got this um so we have input from the user like two three four and multiplication right multiplication is not uh, uh is not a number but we would like to store all those tokens all those things in our vector right uh so what we can do is we can say okay um we have an enum which is our value uh and then the um the value is um it can be um a number and in which case we storing like uh e32 uh or it can be um uh a no, string i cannot use a string but let's say it's an operation and the operation is um a string right so i need to get the syntax right so how do i yeah i need to use a tuple i think so i'm storing i have my uh type yeah so now i have uh my value type, which can be either a number or a op. And then if it's a number, it kind of stores uh, uh, I32. And then if it's an op, it stores a, a string. And then I can create um, my vector um, out of, uh, yeah, so I have a number one. And yeah, I have to say value value num1 and value num2. And then I have also an operation, which is um, the value op, which is, uh, in my case, multiplication, right? And that would be a string. So I have to say to owned. So now I have. Um, I have, you know, numbers and strings in my vector, and I can kind of do again um, for item in data. I can do. I can kind of print this print line. Right. So and we print an item and it complains that item doesn't display doesn't have a display so we say do use debug and now uh we have so what we have we have a third item which is uh multiplication so we can't be multiplying it um, but we can still multiply this one so we can multiply the second value so let's multiply the second value and then just let's just print let's just print what we have at data 0 data 1 and data 3 so we're not doing anything with data 0 so we getting um so we have nothing happened to zero uh, one got multiplied by 10 and then uh, two has um, the operation so because all those things are not yeah i actually didn't uh, derived um, yeah so what we can do is we can say derive debug yeah what's the syntax for that it's with the square brackets can i call yeah i don't remember the syntax for the deriving let's quickly check it um, so i need the 
Um, there is no example here. Rust derived debug. Okay, so it's a square and then, yeah, so I got the brackets wrong. Well, square brackets. Great, so we have derived debug trait for our data type such that it works. We could try deriving a display also. Let's see if that will work. And let's print it with the display. Okay, what are you complaining about? But I just derived it. Okay, so maybe I got the syntax wrong. Let, let, let's ask the compiler. Um, yeah, I need to, I need to import that. So yeah, the ID is a little bit unhelpful. Use std format display. Right, will you like that? I, no, 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 debug. No, it doesn't like that. Okay, screw that. I'm not gonna spend time. Let's just print the debug instead. So. All right, let's do that. Run. Uh, yeah, so that's right. So now uh, that doesn't work because we haven't implemented. Um, so we have a value, but we can't multiply a value with, uh, with 10. Then we would have to implement a bit more fancy things to work on our values. So we, we're not going to do that today. Uh, so let's screw this. So we're not changing the result. We're not using the value. We're just printing what we have in our vector. Yeah, that's okay. All right. Whoa, it didn't work neither. Uh, what we do. So, um, yeah, that's right. So I cannot print afterwards. Yes, it eventually worked. So we do have three items in the in our vector. The first two are numbers and the third one is a string. So, yep, it works, great, let's move on. So what else do I need to talk about vectors? Um, yeah, so push to add an item and the difference between the, um, the square brackets and get. Uh, as I said, like you may you want to use square brackets if you are taking care of the uh, bound checks yourself, and if you if if it is a programming error to have something out of bounds, uh, then of course you can use panics and you can use the square brackets. But if the input depends on the user or you're reading something from a network or whatever, it's outside of your control. And then it may happen that you will be outside of the bounds because of that. Then you should not use square brackets because your program should not crash. Your program should deal with something that is outside of the programmer's control. If the error is in a programmer's hands, then yeah, I mean, it should not happen. So when you panic, of course, it's a programming error and you fix it. But if it's something kind of external, then always use get. All right, so then the final uh, thing that we uh, want to talk about is the uh, hash map. Um, so a hash map is useful and it might come handy for you for the uh, programming exercise that we have in assignment two, because you may want to have a dictionary or kind of like a store for your variables. So you may want to have um, something like uh, if you, if, I don't remember what was the keyword that we've used, but if you have three times four 
and then you say I want to have some sort of um, uh, name, uh, let's say uh, that's an age, and you want to define it such that age now equals seven, right? So it's it kind of like it's uh, like an assignment where you say age equals seven, right? Um, if you want that, then you need to map what age is uh, and what value it has, right? Uh, so to do that, um, obviously the best data structure for keeping track of that is um, is a dictionary uh, or a hash map in Rust. So let's call it dictionary to, yeah, okay, let's call it map. Um, although map is a keyword, like the, there are functions called map. So you can have a variable map, but it's uh, misleading for someone who reads the, the code. So let's call it, um, yeah, let's call it dictionary. So we have a hash map um, and we call new. And then um, we can insert. So what we can do is we can say uh, our dictionary insert, and then we specify the key. And in our, in our case, it could be a string um, uh, like this, but it, you know, if, if you're actually doing it properly, uh, you will have values which are numbers, which are operations, and you also will have variables, right? So you can have a var, which is indexed by, let's say by a string, in which case our key will not be h, it will be a value variable uh, called h. And then here you will have a value, which is a number seven, right? Yeah, that need, needs to be a string. So uh, you could say, yeah, uh, I will use string literals just to make, just to make it slightly different. All right, so now it almost works. Uh, that will complain about lifetimes, does it? Yeah. Yeah, let's screw that. Uh, let's just take ownership. Okay, so then we have to say to own. Okay, and then we also have to say that our dictionary is mutable. And then we can uh, get, again, we can iterate over the keys we can iterate over values uh, or we can get a particular element. So if I say uh, dictionary, um, dictionary, uh, yeah, we have to, so vector and uh, strings are kind of, uh, they exist. Yeah, and hash map you have to um, kind of import uh, to, to use. Um, yeah, let's say, and we need to put a key. So because I don't want to be typing this all the time, let's say let h equals this. I'm missing bracket. Yep, and then we have H. So H is a value, and then we have a key, and then if we say H, then we're gonna get something. Uh, and then let's say let value equals yeah. So now we uh, yeah we don't want to move it. We want to reference it. Oh. That's right. So now, um, if if we do that, we can get none if the key doesn't exist, or if we if we get some value, uh, some reference to a value if the key exists. In our case, it exists because I just put it there. But if I didn't, like if I didn't do it, then it will return none, right? So again, you can um, do something here uh, and. Um, so we, we know map that we can do something on the value inside if it exists or kind of don't do anything if, if, if it doesn't exist. 
uh, you also have um, kind of um, uh, calls such that you can, um, for example, um, do like you, you can use um, or else, and then do something if the value is nothing, if, if it's none. So then you, uh, like if, if I want to have some result. Um, so if I'm doing something and the value is um, um, not like non-existing, then I can say, uh, okay, then do kind of do this alternative, right? So if value is none, then use the, the the argument to my function as a, a uh, as a fallback as a kind of a default value, uh, or you can say uh, or else, and you can put a closure, uh, and then you will kind of do something with the uh, with the case where value is none, uh, or you can extract the value uh, and do something else uh, which returns the result with an error if the um, if the value is not okay, so you have kind of a mechanisms to deal with uh, with errors. I I, I mean uh, I'm not gonna spend time on it because Carl will talk about error handling and uh, recovery of um, of yeah. So in, in any case, we can kind of do something. One useful pattern here though is that sometimes you want to insert um, you want to modify, for example, uh, let let's do kind of a like a, a count of um, um, so let's say if I, if I define my variable for the first time, it works. It kind of uh, injects the the va variable in. But if I try to define the variable for the second time, it doesn't do anything, right? Uh, because I I should not uh, they they should be immutable. Let's say okay. So then uh, what I can do is I can ask. So I can ask if I do have um, if I do have a value. So instead of doing get, I can say element um, with the key, and then I have uh, some facilities. Um, yeah, let's go to the uh, to the hash map. So yeah, it's not called element; it's called entry. Um, so. With the entry, you can, um, yeah, so with the, uh, you have some facilities again, same as with the, um, with the option uh, to do something with the entry of the, of, the, um, of the underlying map. So for example, if I don't have uh, an H, I can say or insert, and I can actually add the default value, right? So I, instead of just doing insert, I can say, if I don't have age, then I will insert this value. Uh, otherwise I will not do anything. I will not change what it already has, right? So if I do this instead of this, then what happens is um, I'm checking if I have age already in, and if I don't, I put this default value, but if I have, I don't change anything, right? Um, and then you have other other options, like you have, um, you've seen the API here. So you have uh, various things that you can say, you can modify the, the, um, the, uh, the value uh, and so on. So you can um, insert with a particular function so that the function will generate a, a value and so on. So you can kind of, uh, check the API and um, find a particular behavior. It, it, it is the same with the uh, with the string. So like you know the API um, the API um, help is is great because it kind of gives you all the uh, various things that you can do with the underlying collection. And in particular with string, you have uh, a number of uh, split, um yeah split uh, facilities so you can do normal split on a particular um, terminator 
uh, we used a split white space, which was kind of a splitting our uh, string with the with the white space. You can define the terminator yourself, uh, and so on. So just just check it out, uh, because the you know there is quite a lot of facilities that you can use uh, to operate on strings and op on strings and operate on the elements, uh, which um, not elements on entries that you will get from the entry call and also on options that you will get from the either of uh, getting the element of the vector or of the uh, of the dictionary. All right, so that kind of covers the uh, the vector and the vector macro. Uh, we covered the uh, the entry and uh, insert. And then the final thing is the iterators. So iterators, as I said initially, they are quite fun. Uh, and they make Rust quite powerful uh, because you. It turns out that it really is inspired by Haskell, and it kind of um, provides all those uh, abstract facilities that you have with the um, with the more um, functional flavor of processing collections. So the like you know in in um, in Go. You basically have four loops, and you say item in, um, uh, yeah, is it in? I don't remember the syntax. You basically have the range. I think it, it's in. Uh, and then you have some sort of a range of some sort of um, yeah collection type. Um, and then you kind of iterate iterating over stuff, right? Um, and that's fine. But if I need to process, let's say, um, I need to get um, uh, get all odd numbers and then um, add them. Um, what we can do is let's say I have all odd numbers and then um, add um, um, equivalent number from one um, sequence, right? So um, I want to get all possible odd numbers, and then I want to add them. So it will be like one, three, five, and so on. So one is one, um, and then three is two, uh, five is three, and so on, right? So I have uh, my odd numbers like one, uh, three, five, seven, and then they have an index one, two, three, four, right? And I want to get and get the first first four, right? So if if I were to implement this uh, using a Go. I would have to iterate over the numbers, um, like all numbers, get the odd numbers, and then again generate a, a range which goes from one, two, three, four, and then kind of um, combine them together into intermediate value, and then from that sequence kind of uh, produce um, four, the first four. And in, in Rust, because you have this. Um, functional uh, collections and, and iterators, what you can do is you can say, okay, uh, from, um, uh, let's do this as a comment. So you can say, I have, uh, you know, all possible numbers that we can start from zero and then we can filter uh, the numbers by um, checking if the, if the number is odd, right? So we want the odd number. So X modulo two is different than zero. Uh, and then we uh, want to um, so we want to add. Uh, yeah, so now we want to add from uh, a, a sequence which goes one, two, three, four. Uh, so what we will do is we will zip it with the sequence which goes from one onwards, and then we will uh, map our pairs because now we have the odd, odd numbers 
as a first item and then one, two, three, four as the, as the second. So we have kind of, a, uh, we have a tuples which are A and B. And then what we do is we say A plus B. And then we're gonna take uh, the first four and we're gonna collect this, right? So I, to make it a little bit cleaner, let's say I will call it like this. Okay, and that kind of gives me um, let the result be this, and then the result is a uh, print line. So let's say the result. Uh, result doesn't have uh, that, should be. Uh, yeah, let's check what the compiler complains about. As it should complain. Uh, yeah, it, that, it cannot work out what the result type is. Um, so the type, the result type will be uh, a list. Yeah, let's let's say it's a vector of e32 numbers, and then the vector doesn't have a display trait, so it will be a debug. Okay. Right. So we have we have th those tuples. So we have two, five, eight, and eleven, which is exactly what we wanted. And I kind of achieved that without doing a single for loop. Like I, I've managed to to do that without using a for loop at all. Uh, I only use the <clears throat> the facilities that Rust has for manipulating collections such as filter, zip, map, and take, uh, those kind of the abstract functions. And um, the, um, the iterators in, in Rust are lazy, such that if I didn't do this collect thing, uh, nothing would happen. Like it would not uh, actually produce uh, any result yet because it's like in Haskell, uh, some of the some of the calls will not do anything until you really need something to be consumed. Uh, in, in our case, as you've noticed, um, I have one infinite list here and I have another infinite list here. And like in languages which you have to use for loops, you can't really deal with infinite lists. You have to have range, right? Uh, you cannot say like forever from zero to infinity, do this and then your for loop will never finish, right? But here I can say, like, you know, I have an infinite list uh, saying, yeah, from zero to infinity, filter me all the uh, odd numbers and then zip it with another infinite list um, and then do this uh, com combination of the, the first items from the first list and the items from the second list such that I can add them together. Um, so I, I zip them, I zip two infinite lists into tuples and then I've added the, um, them together and then I only took the first four. If you want to take the first, you know, 10, you just need to change uh, one, um, one number here and the logic will still work and the logic is quite uh, con con uh, concise and um, kind of um, gives you what exactly is happening. If I turn this code into my nested for loops, this code will be probably five times longer and it will be much more difficult to reason about because I would need to sort of understand all those loops, all the inner loops that are happening and all the variables that are happening in those loops. Whereas here, I don't have any variables. I only have this sort of abstraction over the logic of what is happening. And then I can kind of do this. So those, um, if you, again, if you look at the API, so you can sort of uh, check uh, what functions do you have? Um, so you have map, um, you have all, you have any, um, you have, you can count stuff, of course. Um, you, yeah, we, we talked about finds and faults. 
So I can even like fold the whole thing into a sum uh, with a single line and so on. So you do have those are very nice, yeah, min, max, all those functions that we discussed like a couple of slides before on um, and zip. Uh, one, one thing that I wanted to do was uh, zip with. So in, in, um, uh, when I was preparing the Fibonacci numbers, um, Fibonacci numbers in Haskell example, um, the, you, you can um, generate a Fibonacci, infinite Fibonacci sequence the same way as I'm generating it here uh, by saying that an infinite Fibonacci sequence is a sequence that uh, goes from zero to infinity and then it is um, zip width and zip uh, takes two, two collections, two lists and creates a third one which has the tuple from the two elements. Uh, zip width is the same, but instead of combining the two, um, two collections into a, um, a single collection with the tuple, it takes the tuple and, and does something with it already here, right? So what you can do is you can say uh, zip width and then you can pass uh, what is the second, second collection and second collection is the same as the first one, but it's offset it by one, by, by one item. So it's one and, and, and so on. And then you can kind of uh, mix it with um, with the sum such that if you have the, um, the the first one offset by the second one, you can kind of create the um, um, yeah the, the infinite sequence. So in um, in Haskell, you know if if you say fib equals uh, zero concatenated with the rest of the of the sequence, where um, the rest is from one, two, and then you do the zip with, and then you say, um, uh, you, you say plus, so you, you basically say, okay, I want the final, um, the, the, the tail of the, of the rest is the zip of the uh, fib and rest, right? So, in Rust, you, uh, in Haskell, you can do that. In, um, in Rust, you cannot, first of all, because you don't have zip width uh, and you cannot kind of uh, recursively define uh, yeah, how you're gonna zip those two together. So this, this produces like a uh, infinite uh, Fibonacci sequence and it's kind of recursively defined on itself and you're using the, the zip width, but with the, um, with um, with the iterators, uh, you do have zip, but you don't have zip width, right? All right, so we kind of zoomed through it a little bit, but I, I hope you got the feel and you also got a feel of uh, how powerful the iterators are. There is one extra co uh, concept uh, with iterators uh, in Rust, and it is that some iterators consume um, some, some functions on iterators consume the iterator and you cannot use it in a subsequent calls and some functions don't. So um, typically like when you are processing um, your, your list or pro pro processing something, then you have to be careful of what will kind of eat up the underlying iterator and the underlying structure and what will kind of leave it untouched. Uh, that has to do with ownership and uh, in some of the operations, yeah, you, you may need to make a copy or you may need to uh, pass certain things by, uh, by reference, depending like what you're doing. But we will kind of discuss those more advanced use cases later on. All right, so I don't know if there were any questions, no questions here. And then in the... Yeah, so Dennis helped me with the syntax for the derive, uh, thanks. Um, yeah, and you cannot derive display, you have to manually format your, your string. So that's different than Haskell. In Haskell, you can derive both display and debug. Uh, in Rust, uh, thanks, thanks Dennis. Uh, you, you can derive debug, but you have to implement display yourself manually. Yeah, that's a good hint. 
All right, that's that's all then for today. Thank you very much, and I will stop.